Great way to start the service, huh? Everything good? All right, good. Let's pray and get started. Lord Jesus, thanks so much for that wonderful testimony. Thank you for the work you do and the work you've already done through this church and through uh, individuals, couples like this who love you and want to serve you. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help us to understand this morning the spiritual principle that you are teaching us here in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, the idea that we, if we sow, we will also reap. If we what we sow, we will reap. And uh, I pray, O oh Lord, you just open our hearts, our minds, help us to understand the concept, and then help us to fall in uh, front of you and surrender to you so that we can sow and reap uh, as you have planned just for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So you guys are getting the idea. It's on all the screens and everything. Sowing and reaping. Sowing and reaping. You've heard the story. I mean, you've heard this uh, thought. You know it's true in work. You know it's true in sports. You know it's true in um, spiritual principles as well. Now, for me, um, it didn't always. It makes a big difference how you sow in terms of determine how you're going to reap. For me, I worked as an undercover police officer during my career in Washington, D.C., and so I worked uh, buying uh, cocaine and marijuana and methamphetamine. I traveled around the country doing this. I uh, bought guns. I even, one time, I even uh, had a guy who was stealing animals from uh, Petco for drug dealers. So he would come in, and the drug dealers would say, hey, I want an iguana, or I want a turtle, or I want a whatever. He'd go to Petco. This guy was amazing. He could go into the cage, and he could grab... And so this time, I got a call when he had a bird, some expensive parakeet, and I bought an expensive parakeet, me thinking that if I did this, all the guys in the office would think, that guy is really something. You know, I was so creativity, and they would award me, and I would reap joy and, you know, the applause of my... Instead, they called me Ace Venture, a pet detective, and wanted to know if I worked for animal, animal control or the police, whatever. But anyway, this idea, I spent my career... <clears throat> Learning this, I even testified uh, in federal court. I was certified as an expert on undercover work. I could train undercover work. I've trained it around the country, around the world. Here's the only problem. When I retired from the police department, um, it was really hard to find a job with my skills. You see, like, I, I was thinking, do I put on the resume uh, proficiency in lying? Uh, proficiency in determining how much cocaine to buy. and There's just not a lot of jobs that they're looking for that kind of work. So I sowed, I guess you could say wisely, but I got to reap. Everything I got to reap was right there. There's a spiritual principle here. A spiritual principle. We know it's true in life. We know it's true in, <clears throat> in our parenting. We see it and we believe it. However, uh, we may not understand how full this is through Scripture. So just give you a little bit of a picture how often uh, this is used. There are, uh, this is used in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. He refers to this same spiritual principle, sowing, reaping, sowing, reaping. Amos, Jeremiah, Zechariah, Haggai, Jeremiah, Job, Micah, Proverbs, Hosea, Galatians, James, Mark, all the four gospels, all of it include this spiritual principle. So you read. Now, when we open to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 today, in verse 6, we see this. He says, remember this. Because remember, they've been around this. They've heard this. They know this. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Okay? Paul is challenging the Corinthians to help the Jerusalem church. In that little phrase is part of an argument Paul is making to a church that is a little bit wealthier to help a church that is really struggling. And there's a million interesting things in this story, but in order for him to convince the church it's a little bit wealthier, rather than him just appeal to them biblically or appeal to them based on what is right, he compares them to another church that has less than they do and says, that church, that church is your example. That's your church example. Look what they've done. So let's go ahead and do what's right. Now, there's lots of problems with this. The, the church of Corinth, just so you get your geography right, Corinth, even today from Jerusalem, would be a 69-hour drive. That's how far it is. Needless to say, there were not a lot of people over here in Corinth who had been to Jerusalem. They didn't have any short-term mission trips there. 
There was no photos for them to show. Remember that they're passing these letters that we see bound in this beautiful book here. They were passing it around. It was just a letter from the apostle, from the guy who started their church. And they gathered together, and they would get together, and they would read this like this. So he would read what Paul had written. And in there, he's saying, you ought to help this church in Jerusalem, a place they'd never seen, a place they never would see, and they certainly wouldn't know what happened as a result. Okay, so there's your picture. Now we're going to answer three questions this morning. Three questions. Very simple. One, why should City Light Church plant seed? That's us. Why should should City Light Church plant seed? Two, who is City Light Church planting seed for? And then three, where should City Light Church plant seeds? Okay, three simple questions. Let's start with this one. Why should City Light Church plant? Plant seed. And I'm going to start with showing you out of the verse what it says. So Hebrews, excuse me, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. We see here in the Amplified Bible a little bit more clarity in terms of what he was saying here. And the reader could see this. Now remember this, he says. He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. And he who sows generously, and here's the line that you get here. He who sows generously, what? that blessing may come to others. So why should, we, why should we together sow? Why should we do this? Because we want to do this. Why? So that blessings may come to other people. Now let's, let me tell you something. This is opposite the way we think. Absolutely opposite. There is none of you that went to work this week and said, and said I'm going to work this week so the guy in the next cubicle over well six feet away from you this guy is going to make my money nobody does that we don't sow for the benefit of others we sow for the benefit of now there is a a debate here i have three daughters and so i've never actually ever seen any of the currency i have earned it has always gone directly to them Uh, i I don't even know if i've actually any made any money in in my lifetime but but the truth is you do so so i understand you could say your family but really to think that you're going to bless us. I was on a plane a week ago or something, and American Airlines says, we do this because of you. And I say, liar, you do not do this because of me, because if you did, I'd be going free on this plane. If it was only me you were worried about, you would not want my money. Now, the truth is, this is the way we think. So here, Paul comes along and he says to you, you should give. Why? Why should you give? Why should you give? So the blessings may come to other people. This is the upside down thinking of Christianity. It is a blessed way to think. How wonderful would it have been to live in a world where American Airlines was honestly saying that? Isn't it great to think that way? Well, this is the way Jesus thinks. So what we do together as a church in planting seed, we do it, the blessing may come to others. And then he also says, and he never, listen, the Bible never shies away from the reward principle, even in the New Testament. There is a blessing that comes to those who sow generously, those who reap generously. Now some fool will come along and give you some little teeny blessing. So let's imagine that you were going to invest your money somewhere and the guy wanted to tell you, the, inve- the guy was trying to get you to invest, wanted to tell you the big reward you could get. And instead, somebody comes along and they say, yeah, we're going to give you a new set of cutlery. So I'm giving you a million dollars, I'm going to get a new set of cutlery. That's the equivalent of some preacher telling you that if you sow your money at a church, you're going to gain some material reward. That's, that's inconsequential. We know material rewards go away. We don't want those. Lord, please give me something more. Please give me something more. Give me children that love you. Give me a heart that loves you. Give me a church that is surrounded and committed to this principle. Now that I want to reap. Give me eternal reward so that when I see you, you say good and faithful, sir. Now that is worth investment. So why do we plant seed? We plant seed. Blessing may come to others. And so that we see reward. Second question. Who is City Light Church planting seed for? Who is planting seed? Who is it that we're planting seed for? So when I was um, in high school, we moved all the time when I was growing up, uh, five different elementary schools, three different junior highs, three different high schools. And uh, uh, I, I know what you're thinking, I got kicked out of all of them. No, I did not. Uh, I actually, my father uh, just moved a ton. So anyway, so I went to the, all these different places. 
When I lived in northern Maine, they actually stopped school back then in the fall for three weeks because the potato harvest was so important. So everybody had to go work. All these high school kids were out working in the potato farm. So they gave me this job. I was picking potatoes, and the harvester would come through, and then there would be all the potatoes there. And what you would do is you'd take a basket, you'd load it, you'd put it in a barrel, and each barrel you'd get 55 cents for. So you'd try to do as many barrels as you could. End of the day, you'd cash out, you'd go home. Now, let me say, this was really hard work. And it's important that you get that. Um, In Jesus' example to an agricultural group of people who are used to farming, imagine we were all farmers here, and and I give you a spiritual example when I'm saying sowing and reaping, you're thinking right away, that's serious work. That's hard work what he's talking about. There's actually some some, um, uh, difficulty here. And when I'm working on this potato farm, let me tell you, it's some of the hardest work I ever did. Um, it, you putting the uh, potatoes in, trying to, get it, trying to do it fast, fast, fast. But let me tell you something. I never met the owner of the farm. I never met the owner of the farm. I still don't really know who the owner of the farm was. And I didn't benefit any more because the whole farm worked out better. You follow me? So because of that, it was really hard for me to feel motivated except for just my part. Brothers and sisters, you and I are sowing. We are sowing for the Lord Jesus himself. Let me prove it to you. Um, Then he said to his disciples, this is in Matthew 9, 36, 37, 38. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus is the Lord of the harvest. Who are you working for? Who is City Light planting seed for? I'm not planting seed for City Light. I mean, I like this church. I think it's a nice place. I love it. I like you guys. I like the pastor. Uh, but, I, but, you know, we, we're all sold on all that. It's absolutely wonderful. But, oh, here's the beauty. I'm not only given to a pastor I trust and to a, 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 a church I love and to something we're a part of. I'm not only doing that. I'm given to the Lord of the harvest. You and I, who is it planting, uh, City Lights planting uh, seed for? It's for Jesus Christ, the Lord of the harvest. Now, where should City Light be planting seed? Where should we be planting seed? For the, um, when I went to work for the potato farm, they were very specific about where I planted. It's their farm, right? They didn't want me to wake up the next morning and go over to the next farm. They wanted me to work on their farm. In the same way, where should we plant in his harvest field? That's where you should plant. And one of the things in missions and in our giving, we ask ourselves all the time, well, some will say, well, I only do things locally. I'm just talking to a person this week. I only do things locally. Another saying, um, a common one, I was in Africa and I was riding in a, in a car with some other Americans. We were there uh, serving and seeing the work. And as we're traveling along, the person in the car with me says, we're talking about another part of the world, a continent. And we were talking about that, and and she said, I just don't have a passion for Latin America. I said, hold on, just one second. You don't have a passion for a continent full of people? We can't, I mean, we now believe in Africa so much that we have forgiven, forgotten completely about zillions of people over here. Of course, it makes no sense. Of course, it doesn't make sense to say, I think local, you think local. Brothers and sisters, we think about his harvest field. Here, there, wherever, Lord, where, where would you want your seed planted? I want to plant it there. I want to plant it here locally. Yes, and we will, absolutely. And we want to plant it in places we won't ever see or visit. We want to plant his seed in his harvest field. That's the answer to where we should plant is wherever the Lord directs. So, why should churches sow seed? that others might be blessed. Who do they sow seed for? Jesus Christ, the Lord of the harvest. And then where should we sow our seed? In his harvest field. Now, here's one of the ways that we have done this globally speaking. Globally speaking. City Light Church has joined in starting a nonprofit ministry called Innovation and Gospel Impact. Our goal, together with Innovation and Gospel Impact, is our goal is to fund and equip local superheroes here and around the world who can help us take the light of Jesus Christ into dark places. Notice in Matthew 9, 36, 37, 38, the emphasis is finding the worker. One thing I've seen in business and in 
police work and in uh, ministry is the, the God raises up leaders, individual people that he uses supernaturally to do his work. And so what we've done is we're partnering together with individuals looking for those that God is starting to use and we fund them and we equip them so that that ministry that is small can then expand and we can end up reaping an unbelievable amount of spiritual reward. So just to give you some of the ones, um, if you remember in Acts 13, they started this way. They started the whole first missionary journey. Together as a church, they set aside Paul and Barnabas, and they said, these two are the guys we're going to invest in, and they took an offering, and they sent them out, and through that, I don't know if you've noticed, but Paul planted a few churches. He did pretty well. Matter of fact, we sit here today because they sent him on that journey. Well, we do that too in other places in the world in here. How about Alex? Alex in Uganda. You guys have heard us talk about Alex. Alex was 17 before he got his first pair of shoes. No kidding. Um, Alex is a man who has built a ministry there in Uganda to reach literally millions of people. However, he needs some little support along the way. We invested with him and purchased 100 bicycles. I think Nate has mentioned this to you. 100 bicycles. Because he said, Dale, here's, here's all I need from you guys over there. See, they didn't need me to go over there and tell them, hey, Alex, why don't you step aside? Let me take over and show you how things should be done. They didn't need that. He already knows all that. He speaks the language. Knows everybody in the community. Lived there his whole life. Knows how to talk to people. Knows what's needed. So let me just stand back and say, Alex, what do you need? And Alex says to me, Alex, is what we, Dale, there's all we need. Would you give me enough money that I could buy 100 bicycles? I said, what do you want to buy bicycles for, man? We're talking about ministry. I want to talk about ministry. You're talking about starting some bicycle repair business. He said, no, 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 no. I just need bikes. Why do you need bikes? Well, I have plenty of ministers who live in the very remote sections around Uganda. He said, what I'd like to do is if I can give them a bike, they will give me a church. So what do you mean? He said, if they get a bicycle, all they do to pay me back for the bicycle is they go up into the rural parts where they want to go anyway, and they're able to get into places they couldn't normally get, and they get up there, and they stay a week, and they plant churches, and then they are able to foster and, 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 and parent two different churches as they build them up. This is the idea, 100 bikes, 100 churches so far. He says we're well on our way for the first 50 churches already because of what this church did sitting here in Falls Church, Virginia. Incredible, right? Now that's sowing, and then we're seeing reaping. Uh, then we've got Ravi and his wife, Ravi Sharma, and his wife in India. And uh, Ravi says to me, uh, we know Ravi from a uh, long time serving together, and he is this faithful guy who is serving the Lord. Now he and his family, all they really need every month, he says, all we need is $150 a month. It'll pay all his expenses, everything he needs, family, kids, everything. No problem. Out of that investment, out of that investment, Rave and his pastors have planted nine churches right now. They're pastoring nine churches in New Delhi and in Upper Pradesh. That's going on right now because you and I, sitting here, writing our checks, investing in the work, God is taking that work and exponentially growing it in India. Exciting times, huh? Good good way to invest our money. How about people? Let's think about people. How about Ariola? You guys know Ariola. Many of you, she was with us right from the beginning. We launched her. She was our first missionary. She used to be here at this church, and then she went to Mexico, and since she's been there, her idea was to start a coffee shop to share the gospel. She now has two coffee shops in this part of Mexico reaching young adults for Christ. She's actually coming here in a few weeks, but Ariola in Mexico is another example. Um, Carlos and Rosie in Tijuana, Mexico. Carlos and Rosie in Tijuana, Mexico. These guys, these guys. Let me let me just say, they have a, a ministry local. Rosie from Mexico grew up. Everything they grew up there. They speak the language. They know the people. They have a ministry to rehabilitate uh, drug addicts. They have a ministry in orphanage. They have uh, two churches. They have uh, ministry at the dump. They have a, uh, a mission center that, that ha- clothes and feeds 150 men every night. Um, and through our funding, they've been able to add one to that to where they're right in the middle of the prostitution area and they're able to go out in teams and reach prostitutes for Christ. All of these things they do for 190000 a year. 
190,000 a year. We give them just a little bit more, and our sowing is now reaping eternal dividends. While you and I sit at home watching TV on Thursdays and Tuesdays, they have teams out in the community building relationships with prostitutes, trying to rescue them from there. How do we do this? How do you and I make that kind of impact? All we do is do exactly like he did. said, we sow, and then we get to reap. Now, locally, what would happen if we just had more seed to sow? What if we could invest more? How many Carlos and Rosies are there here, right here locally? We already work with many. We already work with many, these wonderful people that God is saying, but what could we even do right here through our own church? Well, we could have a greater impact on foster care. We could make a difference here in our community. We've got the opening. I've got the email I can read to you where they are asking us to do more, and we're trying to determine, can we do more or not? We've got the possibility that is, I get a call from the food guy this week who delivers, who gives us a lot of free food, and he says, look, can you just take more? And I say, I don't, I don't know for sure if I can take more, because we've got to think about, are we able to do that? Brothers and sisters, the more we sow, the Savior will let us reap more too. Right here locally. What about a center like this in multiple places? We've got opportunity right now to have a center like this in Washington, D.C., to have a center in Bailey's Crossroads, it's needed desperately in Annandale. We <clears throat> want to be invested. We want you to visualize the abundant harvest that Christ can make if you and I are willing to sow our seed here at City Lake. What happens if this happens? Well, there is one other thought here. Um, in this verse. And the verse starts this way. It says, in closing, there's one phrase that you shouldn't miss. It says, Paul says that people or churches can sow sparingly. They don't always sow generously. They can sow sparingly. And what happens is they will also reap sparingly. Now, uh, what it means um, is actually in the language of the day, it means uh, some sow holding back. Some sow holding back. And then God, in, in likewise, holds back from them. Uh, American churches, a large part of what American churches are to do, in, in my opinion, the reason God has shifted the income to the West from all the places around the world that are in desperate need is because God had this equation where he trusted us to move forward with the funding he gave us to help all these brothers and sisters over here, much like what Corinth was asked to do with Jerusalem over here. So here's the picture. But instead, many, I'm going to say most churches, hold on to their seed. They'd rather have prettier shades and better carpet than they would go over here and invest a bike and plant a church. It's far away. How can I convince you to keep giving if I'm talking about bikes in a country you'll never go to? It doesn't sell. But if I show you a new pretty building, now you say, oh, that's a great place. That's a great place. I got a new video going on downstairs and the kids are, oh man, that's church I want to be in. No, brothers and sisters, what I want is a congregation. What Nate dreams of is a congregation who says, where, where, what are we doing eternally in the lives of individuals? What is it God is doing here and around the world? That's the kind of church I want to be. I don't want to hold any seed. I want to sow generously because I want as a church to reap generously. I want to be part of something where we get to reap generously. Praise the Lord. Amen? Am I right? I don't want to hold back. I don't want to end my life like the rich guys that are making that pact now about not dying with a bunch of money that they're going to pass on. They want to give it away before they die. That's how we ought to live as a church. Let's just give it away. Let's invest it. Invest it wisely and let's see the change that God can make in people and churches around the world. Our dream is that we would shine the light of Christ in dark places and that we would see churches planted all over. Let me give you a couple numbers in closing. 17. 17. Now that number is important because that is the number of months this church has been together. 12 months of it has been during a pandemic. And yet together we as a church have given over $250,000 away to the causes of Christ around the world and locally. Amen? Amen. 17 months. 17 months is number, another number you should know. Four. So far, 17 months ago, we started over there at the high school, four represents the number of new 
partners, churches that we're working together. We now have Sia Luz. We now have the Loud Thai service downstairs. We have the church in D.C. And we have here, that's four different ones. And we're being asked to take on more. Brothers and sisters, these numbers will grow exponentially as you and I invest and sow for Christ in these last days. Let's pray together. As you pray, I want you to catch this. The Lord of the harvest... The Lord of the harvest is who you're serving. It's who I'm serving. And when you think about that abundant harvest that he wants to give us, oh, how Jesus wants to bless and reach people here in this area. Oh, how Jesus wants to reach and bless people all around this world. And oh, how he wants us, whether we're plumbers or policemen or government workers or politicians, he wants us to work harder and invest more in his work so that he can do the supernatural work that only he can do. With your eyes closed, I want you to see he's asking for workers to go into the harvest field now. Is he really asking you to give up your, everything you're doing and go to Uganda? I don't think so. He might, but I don't, I don't think so. I think Alex has that down. But what he is asking you to do is I want you to think about before him. Take a minute. Will you be willing to work a little harder, to budget a little different, to invest a little bit more so that you are sowing generously? as that is your work in this harvest. That is my work in this harvest, much of it at least. Take a minute between you and the Lord Jesus. Ask the Lord, Lord Jesus, I want to be a worker in your harvest field. What do you need from me, Lord? What do you need from me? Just take, take a minute here between you and Jesus. Lord Jesus, I'm so glad that you have selected me and my brothers and sisters here to be workers in your harvest. And Lord Jesus, we are honored, we are encouraged, we are amazed even that you would ask us to be part of your team. Lord Jesus, you didn't take us against your will. You chose us. You didn't get a bunch of workers in your harvest field who you didn't want and you were stuck with, who got traded to you in a bad trade. No, you selected each one that sits here today who knows you, Lord. You select them say, I want that one. I want, I want that one. I want this family. I want this one. That's going to be my team. My team. And now, as the Lord of the harvest, Lord, will you take us workers and will you help us to work really hard at raising kids? Will you help us to work really hard at painting houses. We help us to work really hard in finance. We help us to work really hard in um, Zoom calls. We help us to work really hard, Lord Jesus, serving you faithfully as the worker you've made us, all with the idea that you, Jesus, you're who we're working for. You are the Lord of our harvest. Lord, may you be elevated and you be honored through every hour we work, every bit that we serve, so that we, Lord Jesus, can be part of this supernatural harvest that only you can bring in these last days. Jesus, we look to you and we pray for abundant harvest. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand and worship with us?